Yeah, so cold calling is really hard, especially when you're new. In general, it doesn't get like particularly easy over time. It's just something that you get comfortable with, but the level of difficulty doesn't change. So it's a very odd thing to learn. And what I'd say is this, um, when you're cold calling, you gotta, let's do some basic psychology here. How do you climb a mountain? Right. How you climb a mountain? You climb it in stages. You don't just show up to the base of a mountain and then reach the top. You got to think about stage one, stage two, stage three. And if you do this, you reach the top of a mountain. So this is called chunking. It's a superpower of ours. It's like in a crazy skill that we have. We have the ability to chunk complex tasks into smaller pieces. So how do I go from phone number on a screen to meeting booked with a random person that I've never spoken to before? Let's chunk that. So you have the first five seconds of, of a cold call the next 15 to 20 seconds, the next one to five minutes, and then the close. And you got to think about how do I handle each of those four sections? How does the first five seconds buy me the next 15 to 20? What am I going to say in those next 15 to 20 seconds is going to buy me the next one to three minutes? And then how am I going to close this out once I've got the person talking and there seems to be enough interest and it makes sense? So that's what I'd say, like actually map that process. And I use the mic drop method, which is permission, problem, provoke, promise. That's the four ways that I do it. There's other methods out there, but that's the tip I would give. And I would literally make a sheet on, or, 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 or print something out, whatever you want to do. But I think a sheet really helps to visualize it when you're doing it daily and you're making your dials. And mark where you lose them. Where do people object, get off the phone with you? When you have, because you're going to have way more unsuccessful outcomes than successful outcomes. And I would mark, where am I losing people? Is it in the first five seconds? Is it in the next 15 to 20 seconds? And you can self-diagnose then and be like, okay, clearly what I'm saying in the in the 15 to 20 second mark isn't working. Let me, let me reconfigure that. Let me change it up. Let me try something different there. And over time, you'll find the script that works where you're like consistently getting through all four segments every time you're climbing the mountain, every time you're climbing the mountain. It feels great. Like it, it never goes away. That feeling of climbing that mountain always feels great every time. I've not done it yet, but I'm I'm like extremely interested in it. In fact, I can see myself in two years time testing SDRs if I was hiring them on their ability to prompt AI. No joke. Like why on earth would I not want to use that? Like it's there for me to use. And the fact that it can take, for example, an article and turn it into a checklist or take um, content and summarize it for you. And then you can use that summary to turn it into something that you would actually send a prospect. That's magical. That never existed before. Like you had to do that yourself before. No SDR or AE or anybody I know was ever doing that kind of stuff. Why would you not use that? So I, I think, yeah, I, I, I personally have it as like a task this year to learn how to prompt AI. Cause I'm noticing that's the trick. Everybody has access to chat GPT. Most people suck with it. They don't know what to do with it. And there's no instruction, right? There's no instruction manual on this thing of like, here's everything you can do with it. Here's all the, the creators themselves don't even know all the possibilities you could use it for. So really it's gonna come down to, do you understand how to prompt that AI and get what you want from it? And I really want to learn that. So I, if you're an SDR AI, there, you, need to, you need to get on chat GPT. You need to just get in general on prompting AI. The, the ability to synthesize is always going to be in demand. Being an aggregator of yeah. anything is always highly valuable because we live in a world now where it's it, like the level of information is exploding per hour, right? It's like exponentially increasing per hour. So yeah. anything that can like trustworthy and can aggregate on like a, a level that gives you confidence. And that's what that's what these AI tools are, especially ChatGPT. I, okay, I'd say there's, I'm gonna, I can't narrow it down. So I'm gonna do two, I'm gonna cheat. I'm gonna answer with two. I think the first is believing that the grass is greener on the other side. Um, the truth is you're always thinking like, oh, there's a better product to sell. There's a better comp plan. There's a better base. There's a better this is a better that. Odds are there's not. I, I just, I can tell you that now having changed careers a bunch there's something to if you're at a company where your manager is decent i don't even say great just decent tolerable 
and they clearly want to invest in you they give you either some education stipend or they do trainings or things like that and you're able to make a decent living and you can get to and sometimes pass quota and you're not like completely getting hammered by an impossible goal or something like that so if any of those things are not there right like that that's the scenario you should stay you should probably stay and odds are you switching you're gonna one of those three is gonna is gonna go bad <laughs> and then you're gonna be like oh man i miss i miss that you know i miss, i want to go back to that and i'll say this as a seller you're always two quotas two quarters of missed quota away from being fired that's the reality anybody tries to tell you otherwise it's not true just look at what happened all these great sellers of all these great tech companies recently and they all still got laid off you're always two quarters away from getting fired but when you can build really good political capital and stay at a company for just like a good run, like three, four, five years, like sellers don't stay at a company for 20 years, but I'm talking about a good run for a seller is like three to five years. That's pretty solid. The career growth that you get in those three to five years pays dividends for the rest of your professional career. It's crazy. That one moment of stability in your career, you can ride that literally for the next 20 years and you've always got that one really good run. So that, that's what I would say, just looking back at it, it's probably the biggest mistake I made is I didn't, I, there are a couple of companies I could have stayed a little bit longer, maybe two more years, had a really good run. And uh, I thought the grass was greener and it wasn't. Great. And then the second one I would say is just, um, I wish I had learned more social psychology earlier in my career. I went way too long without understanding very basic concepts like how do people make decisions? Like what is the actual brain science of decision making? I was shocked to find out that scientists, and we're not talking about this year, it's like 2023, I'm talking about like six years ago, scientists were running experiments where they could determine a decision somebody was going to make eight seconds before they were aware that they even made a decision. That's how concrete brain science is. Half a decade ago, we were already knowing what people were going to do before they even knew they were going to do it. <laughs> and I, I know zero of that. Zero. Like, how does that work? What are they measuring? What are they doing? How on earth could you know somebody's going to make a decision eight seconds before they make it? You know, there's science out there that's pretty like concrete and we're just not exposed to it as sellers. And it is so relevant to what we do. Like all day you're talking to people, trying to convince them, influence them, persuade them. And it's like, but you're not using any basic psychology to do it. Like therapists have been convincing and persuading people for decades. Like I, I learned recently about cognitive behavioral therapy. How do you take somebody that has deep rooted issues and help them overcome them? There's a whole science behind CBT. I know zero of it. I'm like, that sounds so useful when I'm dealing with a, like a buyer that doesn't get it, or it's like having trouble convincing the rest of the team. Those techniques must be so useful. So I, I would just say like social psychology is something that you're not gonna get trained on. Most of the major sales trainings don't cover it, but it pays so well to take some time and learn it. So there, there are several authors that I really, really like their work. Todd Capone is one, The Transparency Sale, Everything that he's doing, the webinars and so on, I'm following them. Matt Dixon, the author, author, author of The Jolt Effect, and the research that he's doing is really, really interesting and compelling. Um, David Primer, author of Sell the Way You Buy. These people, they are taking a scientific approach to sales that I haven't seen done in a long time. And it's really valuable to learn what they're saying. And it challenges a lot of the things that I thought I was supposed to be doing as a seller. So it's a, you, you just, you know, selling is one of those things where it's more like, um, it's more like you learn through apprenticeship than you do through practice. Like if you want to be a master carpenter, you don't just pick up a, a knife and start whacking wood. <laughs> You're going to get nowhere. You go learn with another, somebody who already is a master carpenter and they're going to spend four months teaching you how to sharpen the blade. Why? Because they know something about that, that you don't sales the same way. Like, you need to find people that have kind of reached mastery level and be their apprentice and start learning directly from them. That's a much better approach. So find somebody that has reached the pinnacle of wherever you want to be in this profession and 
and really start seeking their knowledge. Yeah, Co so coaching is messy. Like when when done correctly, it's 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 kind of difficult. And what I would say is this: um, coaching, when done right, mixes two elements that don't usually mix very well: personal and professional. Uh, it, you know, if you're if you really are, um, if you do have the right intention to coach somebody, you will get into their personal life because naturally, if somebody's going through something devastating personally, that will show up professionally. And you can't ignore that. And now you're talking about things that aren't in your maybe scope of reference or, or like ability to handle. So th there's a human element to this. And I, I would say what people really want out of coaching is they want psychological safety. And the way you totally butcher any coaching is by taking something that somebody told you in those sessions or those moments and then using it in a way that's manipulative or wrong later on so th that's the worst thing you could do i'd say like that's a great way to ruin trust and credibility which is what coaching is built upon so i would just say that as like to managers like my best coaching tip is the goal somewhere in there even if you can't handle the conversation even if it starts getting into things that are outside of your scope or ability because i was never trained on how to coach and i've been a vp twice it's kind of like crazy so like you, you might find yourself in a scenario where you are responsible for other people and have zero clue on how to actually coach. It is happens every day. But what I told myself was, look, I'm not, I'm not a therapist. I'm not a coach. I don't know these things, but I do understand the concept of psychological safety. I want to build that. And just by giving people a sounding board, that alone sometimes is more than enough that they just feel like I have someone I can talk to and they're not going to use what I say in a manipulative or bad way later on alone without me doing anything else <laughs> was sufficient i like to be really calm and lucid before like a demo and i don't find getting myself too excited the right way to do that so um i'm a practicing muslim and we have a prayer that we say that is supposed to be like uh god i ask you to like loosen my tongue and untie um, my speech so that it's clear and understanding. And it's actually the, the the prayer that Moses, Prophet Moses, peace be upon him, said before he approached Pharaoh and told him, you're not God, which was like a crazy moment in history. And like a lot of things happened after that. <laughs> so it's a very, it's a very critical like prayer. And that's what I remind myself. And I, I try to say that before I go on a cold calling blitz or before I get into a demo and it helps me feel really lucid and like composed and centered and that way I'm in the moment because a lot of the stuff that I find elite sellers do that I try to copy is is very premeditated and not natural for example like using silence to compel a conversation and move it forward that's not a natural skill you're not taught that as a kid to be like hey stay silent when people talk to you right it's not what you're taught or you know trying to make them the center of attention instead of yourself. That's a very unnatural word, naturally egocentric. So doing that is not normal, but there's several like things that elite sellers do that they have to be really lucid and like really premeditated about to pull off. And so I would say if it works for you to hype yourself up, that's great. I view that more of like, if I'm going to the gym, I want to get hyped up and get the adrenaline running. At a demo, I'm like, I don't want to go in there as like an adrenaline rush. I think that's not going to help me at all with what I'm trying to do right now. I think it's actually going to confuse me and make me worse. So just maybe that's me. I know everyone's different, so I can't say that would work for everyone. But I think there's a subset of people that'd be like, wait, maybe he's right. Maybe I should not, <laughs> not juice myself here before the call. <laughs>